Now you just imagine this now. <laughs> Before the wedding started, he literally walked every aisle, every pew, shaking everybody's hand. And he said, I'm hardly going to be on the passenger. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And he went through the whole church. And before he let them do the wedding, he came up front and he said, now, he said, every single one of you are here for this wedding. We're glad to hear we invite you to come and be, uh, you're welcome in our church. And this was a Saturday night wedding. He said, I also want to tell you that tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we've got Sunday school. If you're not working, if you're not in the hospital or the funeral home, I want you to come back and be with us. <laughs> I thought, but that's the way Arlie was. He never went around and said, are you Baptist, Pentecostal, holy? He didn't care. All he wanted, like Brother Stevie says all the time, all we want to do is see the law of Satan. Every single one of those people at that wedding, if they turn God away, they'll give an account for that. Amen? Um, but we're glad to be here this morning. I invited some people to come and be here with us today, and I hope that they come. Oh 
Stevens last night and I had a bunch of his house. So the first or second time I'd ever been there, they had a park in another place and I got confused for a while. And finally, it's behind the front. Finally I found it. <laughs> they sure got a beautiful yard. I, a yard that large and nice is kind of rare. And we're in the fifth chapter book of Matthew. I thought we'd look a little bit at Jesus this last few weeks. I believe in living a holy and separated life. But it all starts with Jesus. Amen. If we're not a Christian, Within ourselves, we cannot walk pleasing to God. We just ain't got the ability. So, if we could have done all these good works and have performed the will of God, Jesus would not have had to have come and suffered on the cross. But since we couldn't do it, Jesus paid a price for us. But with that, there is a requirement for me and you. We must accept that. In faith, we must believe. So, uh, think about Jesus here. Oftentimes, in the world today, uh, in America, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of the people claim to believe in Christianity. Uh, a good portion of them go to church occasionally, at least. And if you ask people, but the millions, they'll say, "I'm a Christian." But Jesus told them in the seventh chapter of Matthew, by their fruit, you shall know them. And I thought here it says, Blessed tempers, fifth chapter, blessed they are which are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, if you live God in Christ Jesus, somebody will give you a hard time. Somebody will persecute you. But it's unfortunate of all these tens of millions of Americans who say they're Christian. You can't tell it. Yeah. All you know is they say they're Christians. Yeah. There ain't nothing about them to tell. Now, take me myself. If I go to the same worldly places the world goes to, if I handle the same language they handle, if I laugh, laugh at the same filthy jokes they laugh at, if I watch the same ungodly programs they watch, why would I expect you to believe I'm a Christian? Yeah. True. By their fruit, you shall know them. But now, you know, there are some people that will respect you for being a Christian. There are some people who will tolerate you. There are some who won't care for you, but they will leave you alone. Then there are some that will persecute you as much as they can get away with for being a Christian. But if we want to go to heaven, we need our sins on the blood. Yeah. Blessed are you when they persecute you, when they say all matter of evil against you falsely. Now, I've had 60 years of experience in the church. Might not have learned as much per year as a lot of folks did, but I learned something. I have seen Christians who brought persecution on themselves because they tried to force the other person to conform to their ideal of Christianity. Or they tried to force the other person to get saved. <coughs> I believe Steve preached the other day, no conversion without conviction. Right. You and I can't save people. We might not talk, but the Lord ain't moving on us. If the Lord ain't moving with conviction, probably all we'll do is make them angry. And they'll retaliate against us. We can bring persecution on ourselves. But if you live a holy life, you live, and the world can see the difference. Now, if you shine a light, the world can see the difference. But they can't see no difference in you and them. That doesn't bother them. The Christian that goes down here to the bar and has a drink, they, they, they don't care if you call yourself a Christian. They don't care if you say, I believe in God. 
if a Christian goes down here and they laugh at the same dirty jokes that the world laughs at, the world feels comfortable with you. You're one of the crowd. But when you become to be a Christian, you become to be no longer one of the crowd. I got saved. I was young. I was a teenager. But I got it. I was just old enough. I was starting to get out in the world. Well, I had some friends that were worthy. But I got saved. I didn't fit with the crowd no longer. I, I, I just was. It wasn't that I was the meanest fellow in the world. I, I no longer told dirty jokes. I no longer handled filthy language. I, I quit going to certain places. So therefore, I no longer fit with the crowd. When you don't fit with the crowd, you disturb <laughs> some people, and they will persecute you for holding the sick. But I used that word. Now, I know there's Pentecostals or Baptists that's holding this church talk about denomination. But there is a biblical holiness that is from God. And that ain't got nothing to do with denomination. I don't care what denomination there is. No doubt there's hypocrites within it. There's people in it that are not saved. But there is a people that are holiness. The word holy, if you live holy, you're living a holiness life before God. There are people who live a life as much as they know they live holy. Now I think sometimes you see, I've got standards but I think a little bit like Stevie's got two boys. One is I guess he considers himself an adult. He's about 18 years old and Steve might say well I wish he had a little more improvement. Uh, the other boy's a scholar. Now, he would tell you he loved both boys the same. But when they do something that displeases him, he'll look at it differently. <clears throat> because he'll measure what he considers their level of maturity, their level of understanding. I think sometimes with the Lord, he looks at how little we understand. And we... But... You know, if you're a Christian, there's times that you don't understand things and you make mistakes. There's times things slip up on you and you, 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 you ain't expecting it. You've made mistakes. But God does not tolerate you deliberately sin. He don't accept it. Unfortunately, I hear when people say, well, I, I make mistakes. Sometimes they're excusing themselves for doing what they know is wrong. God don't accept that. <clears throat> he wants you to live separate from the world to the life he's taught you to live. Now, I might start laying out Dave's life for him. and I might lay out a system that Dave can't do because I lay it out on the best of my knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. But when God tells Dave that fellow, don't do that. He means it. But he tells him, you do that. God means it. Now, I can imagine things and make a mistake and take it on myself to do stuff. And when I get above my understanding, all I do is make a mess. So, but blessed are you when you are persecuted. I don't really enjoy persecution. I don't enjoy it, but blessed are you. When you pay the price, you're blessed. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets which were before you. Now, you know, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I found it awful hard to live up to that verse. When the persecution was coming, I, I wasn't always happy. But there is a way to walk before God to what you can have a joy because you know you're separated and the persecution is coming because you are a Christian. But again, I like to encourage people, don't initiate the persecution yourself. Make sure it's simply because you've done what was right and they took it on themselves to persecute you. 
Now it says, you are the salt of the earth. But the salt has lost its savior, wherein shall it be salted? Is therefore good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Now, salt is a preservative. Remember the story of Lot and Abraham? The angels come down and said, we're going to destroy the city. Abraham said, I, I can't quote word for word, but please, Lord, if I could find 50 righteous people, would you spare the city? He said yes. He goes on down, I believe it was 10. He said, well, you spread the city if I could find just 10? He said, yes. Yeah. But what happened? Four of them were delivered. <clears throat> on the way out, one of them looked back and didn't make it. They didn't make it all the way. But they were, we are the Christian is what has held back the destruction of America. But if we look, are there enough righteous people to save America? That's a question now. Are there enough righteous people standing up and saying, no, this is wrong? Where are the Baptists? Where are the Pentecostals? Where are the Methodists? But Obama said, little girls and boys can go to each other's restaurants. Where are these big leaders at? You're the light of the world. He said it is set on a hill. Cannot be hid. Now, there's a story in history about Mount Zion and the temple. According to them, they had hundreds or thousands of lights in the temple. And on certain nights, at least, they would light those on lights. And all around the countryside, they could see the light shining from the temple. That's history, not scripture. And if you shine a light on the city, people will see it. If you light up the hill, the mountaintop, people will see it. There's a story I was told, supposedly to be true, back in the days of kerosene lamps, as somebody was out down the south of the mountain and they was kind of lost and they yelled. And this woman said, well, you go out there and holler for her. Her husband told her, no, a light of light, and they can see it. When you are a Christian, you can't keep from shining the light if you walk as God would have you walk. Amen. You prepare a light. Plus, you're the only preservative. Those folks, unchristians, have got in their life. You're the only thing preserving the neighborhood. Uh, only the Christians preserve the country. It ain't the center man. It, it ain't the ungodly politician that's holding back the forces of evil against America. It's the people on their knees praying and doing the best they know how to pull out. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Now, if you take that and think about it, if you're a Christian, you shine a light. You don't take your Christianity and hide it. You live it. And your Christianity shows a, shines a light on people's path. Some of them will get mad at you. Some of them will say things to hurt your feelings. And sometimes if they have what they figure to get away with it, they'll beat you up and even kill you for your Christian activity. But, he just said, you're the light of the world. I'm the light now. But when I leave, you're the light of the world. And you, you don't take, uh, you put a light up to take up and see it. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men. Light a candle. Put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And he give a light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your God, Father, which is in heaven. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I can't walk out here with the world and do the same thing they do and shine a lot of Christianity in their path. All I'm shining, all I'm, they, they were happy with me for a while here like that. Because I'm just one of the boys. I'm just one of the crowd. 
It's only when I begin to live a Christian life. See, it ain't my great ability. It ain't my great wisdom. It's the fact that I begin to show them Christ. Amen. See, I'm a trinity. I believe in a trinity. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. And there's some of the people that use that. Because Christ presented God to those people. He actually presented them to people as God. If you live a life and somebody says, show me Christ, so watch me. Because my life shines the light of Christ. It ain't my goodness. It ain't my great wisdom. It ain't my great holiness. But it's Christ that lives within us. If you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Come, think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm coming not to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, there are people who want to keep us under the law of Moses. But that was never intended. The law was added because my hearing aid just went out. Uh, the law was added because of sin. It was added to show people their need of a Savior. Everything about the law pointed to Christ. I don't know about everybody else, but I believe that if uh, Christ had not have died, I hope you can excuse me not for changing your name. Get this one out of me and I can't hear it. When Christ died on the cross, without that death, I believe the prophecies and everything of the Old Testament would have failed. I don't know about you, but that's what I believe. I believe that Christ is the thing when he said it was finished on the cross, I believe he sealed all the promises. He sealed every promise of God. He, 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 give it, he, he put the seal on it. His blood was the only blood that truly forgives sin. Under the law, Moses offered blood sacrifices, but the blood of animals could not take away sin. That's a little better out here. Uh, the blood of animals could not take away sin. So therefore I feel everything of the law was types and shadows looking forward to the New Testament grace plan. And without it, all the promises would have failed. When Jesus died, he sealed all the promises. He sealed all the promises. He brought in the grace plan whereby a man truly could be saved. Under the law, if you committed sin, and you went up and you offered the sacrifice prescribed by the law of Moses, and somehow it's about that, he didn't really do the job. You was walking as God told you to walk, but that blood could not truly do the job. You had to go back and offer sacrifice again next year or next month or whatever. But when Jesus died, he went to the cross, and he shed his blood, and he went before him and he was forgiven. You might have been a thief, you might have been a murderer, you might have been a prostitute, you might have been all kinds of things. But when you got saved, all that past was perfected in the eyes of God. God will never hold that against you again. The only way you can get in trouble with God is future sin. Now, the world may never forgive you for something you've done. Your husband and your wife may never forgive you. Well, the fact is, when God forgives you, He never brings it back against you. It's not taken care of forever. Now then, God sent Jesus not to destroy the law, but the law needed Christ for fulfillment. He come to fulfill the law. The law really could not do nothing at the grace plan to do because the law was sprinkled with the blood of the animals. But the grace plan is brought in the power and the faith. 
by the blood of Jesus. Jesus said it's finished on the cross. I believe from there until the judgment, all the promises are taken care of. And in that respect, I believe what was done on the cross is the final covenant. I don't believe there will be a new covenant. Now, many people believe that in Jeremiah, where he promised the covenant to take away the sins of Israel, that's a chip to be fulfilled. But I've asked a question of some of the people. What would be the blood of that covenant if we had a new covenant? They have salvation taught without the Spirit of God conviction. But said they say, well, whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. After the church is called and this is taking place. But I say what Paul and Peter and them was talking about. Jew or the Israelite had a special place with God under the law. There was a covenant made with the nation of Israel. It wasn't made with the Gentile world. But when Jesus went to the cross and died, after his resurrection, he invited everybody in. Everybody was invited in. So the time come that whosoever, for he was a Jew, whether he was a Gentile, whether he was black, whether he was white, whether he was polka dot, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Of course, we can only call on the name of the Lord and the Father is drawing us. But through the conviction of God, it's without respect to person. As whosoever calls on the Lord will be saved. There ain't a thing about your blood, but I'm keeping saved. That ain't the thing about your blood that will save you either. What will save you is if you believe the gospel. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one job or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. But here's the catch. He says he likes to read the Old Testament. He likes to see the types and shadows. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand them. And there's oodlings and doctrines out there. And people say, well, this one's there and this one's here. And because of this is said, there's a scripture in Romans, 11th chapter. Verse 24 through 27. Paul writing, so I do not have you to be ignorant of service. For it's written in the Bible, and as it is written, he speaks of a time past. All Israel shall be saved. Well, we got a question there. Are we talking about a predestinated event when God's going to save everybody of Israel like love? Are we talking about a faith in God? Certain Israelites were broken out. The branches. They were broken out because of unbelief. When a limb was broken out of a tree, it's no longer part of that tree. Then the people from the wild olive tree were grafted in, contrary to nature, and made part of the root and the fatness of the tree. And then comes the thing that, in nature, if you take a yellow delicious apple branch and graft it into a red delicious tree, that branch will still produce yellow delicious apple. He'll produce what it is. But when God saved the Gentile and he put him in a good tree, he produces the fruit of the good tree. This is contrary to nature. He produces the same holiness. So therefore, here's something I believe now. You don't have to agree with me. But I believe the saved are Israel. But we are the Israel of God. And that all of us are saved are saved. You know, God saved all that went into it. The opposite viewpoint requires a predestinated, you know, like my grandpa, you know, what is he will be, what ain't be, can't be, so don't worry about it, go on about your business. The Lord will take care of it. And God's going to save them whom he chooses to save. So therefore God predestinated 
He's going to save all people descended from Jacob. I simply don't believe that. I believe God will save them and accept the gospel. Regardless of who they are. And I don't believe it's already pre-programmed that you're going to be saved because of your blood. Not one jot and one tittle of the law shall be changed. It's not going to be destroyed. It was not. Christ didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. Although there are certain prophets and things in there not really the law. They're just the things that God had told them that would happen. Now then. Whosoever there shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now I believe that there are people that are Christians that understand more than others. And therefore, do a better job. But, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and scribes, you shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees were a very religious people. According to history, they about the most religious folks you ever saw. They were so religious, again, when I'm talking about history, the Pharisee wouldn't eat dinner with another Jew unless he believed he paid tithes on the dinner. Jesus said, Woe, woe, and you Pharisees, Christ, you, Christ, you pay tithes on. He's talking about garlic and stuff like that. I can't even pronounce all the names. You pay tithes on herbs in the garden. But you've omitted the more weighty matters of the law. Love, mercy. The Pharisees wrote, scriptures on their borders of their clothing. But Jesus said in your you are not the quietest of Paul's at times of when they were having festivals and things in Jerusalem to make sure that people did not catch a grave and become unclean they painted them on whitewash so they would be shined out, and people wouldn't accidentally touch a grave. But he said, inwardly, you're not the white sculpture. Outwardly, you know, you're shining white, but inwardly, you're full of dead men's bones. You, in your hearts, you ain't God. Don't be like that. That ain't gonna work. They claimed God. They, they made a profession, but they didn't possess it. Now, you may be a Christian, not understand it. But without you profess Christ, without you possess Christ, you're just a non-Christian. For I say unto you that except your righteousness exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I guess times are going to get close like that. We're going to get over our papa next week in the question of divorce. Now, I don't know whatever people believe. I can only teach what I believe to be true. But there's a difference between you putting your wife or husband away and them putting you away. You have restrictions on what you can put them away for. Um, Janice got on to me sometimes. I, I say something about, you know, you know white bark the bread. She said, you know, but I, it's, a, it's a silly exaggeration. But your wife don't cook like you want to. There ain't no right, no right to put her away. You ought to cut, cut, find out how well she can cook before you marry her. <laughs> I, I, that's a silly exaggeration, but it's true. There's one reason you got to, you got a right to put your husband and wife away. That is they commit fornication. But what if they put you away? You got a husband or wife? They're not Christians. They're good woman, good man. You got a right to put them away. But they say, hey, I ain't living like this. And they put you away. What then? 
Bible says you're no longer under bondage. So, many people don't agree with me on that. Uh, I, I, I have actually got enemies among them, some of the Pentecostal people because I teach that just because you've been married twice don't mean you're going to hell. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, not all Pentecostals. Some agree with me. Some don't agree with me. But see, sometimes we make things so hard on other people. We make rules and regulations that are not founded in the Scripture. And you know where that doctrine comes from? Since I'm here on it, it comes from the Catholic Church. In the early days, the Catholic Church created a doctrine mm -hmm. that if you was not married by a priest, you wasn't really married. Right. If you were not married in the Catholic Church, you was not really married. And under no circumstances could you get a divorce. Mm -hmm. However, if you were important enough, had enough political pull, had enough the higher-ups in the church could grant you an annulment, which says you were never married, even though you were married to the priest, even though you were married in the church, the higher-ups could say you never was married. It, it wasn't a divorce, that was an annulment. But you were putting your husband and wife away. Actually, let's stay with what the Bible says. And if your cousin, your uncle, your aunt, it's missed their life up, your brother, your sister. They, and they, they, their life is so mixed up, they can't fix it. And they come in here and bite them in the altar. That's right, amen. They get saved. The Lord will forgive them all that. Take care of it, amen. He'll, he'll forgive them for all that. If they get saved, then they can go to heaven right along with you. Sometimes we make things unreasonably rough. And... We create areas where people cannot comply with. I don't know, I might have told you before I got My grandfather got married when he was about 20 years old. The fact is, my grandfather don't change one thing. His wife left him for another man. I finally figured out over the years, he never did talk about it. Both of them got remarried. When my grandfather was 74 years old, he got saved. Him and my grandmother had great-grandchildren. <clears throat> Would you honestly say that he should leave my grandmother and go back to his, his first wife, who had a husband and great-grandchildren too, and he should go back and try to get her back? I don't believe so. It's tough. It's a touchy. some things man can't fix. All you can do is seek forgiveness. It's a touchy situation. I'm sorry, Steve. I said it's a touchy situation. It's touchy. Because but how? Life. No doubt, my grandfather's first wife was at fault. But if that woman prayed that forgiveness, how could she change what her life has created? You know, we we was always taught and raised that, or at least I was. Uh, you know, you know, it's a simple one. Uh, that if you was to divorce, you wasn't, you know, you couldn't remarry and so on and so forth. And they would say if you did remarry somebody, the only way to make it right would be to go back to your first spouse and make it right. And that's how we raised. But the Bible says if, in the old Bible that if you go back and take your spouse back, she's therefore unclean. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. But then a lot of people say, well, that was under the law, and this is under the grace. And then some would say, what did Jesus say? And then what everybody said in the Bible is true. It gives us reasons why the fornication, so on and so forth, why you divorce. Then it goes on to say, Jesus said, but what God is doing together, let no man put asunder. So it's one of those things where you can really see it from every angle. You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's been a lot of disagreement. But I believe my wife's family, someone kind of believed that differently than me. And one of her nieces has been married twice and got two children, but two different men. My wife's sister told her one day she loves this girl. 
the Pharaoh got saved. So, well, if God joined them together, I don't believe everybody joined by God. That's a lot of problems out there. But listen, God gave you the institution of marriage. I won't let my grandson bring his girlfriend he's living with to my house and sleep together. <clears throat> Well, that that is married is a sinner. I recognize their marriage. So I believe they are joined together because God gave us the institution to join us together. And I believe two sinner people, man and woman, they get married. I believe they're joined together in the eyes of God. When they go deliberately get married, I don't believe the man walks up here and he's got a set of wives in there. He wants to appear to get saved. That he can get up and say, Well, hey, me and you got married in sin, so I, that don't count. I will leave you. I don't believe that works in the eyes of God. No. I believe that he is bound to his marriage. You marry a Muslim girl. I hope he should. But if you do, and you get saved, and she's a good wife, because she's a Muslim, you can't leave her. As long as she treats her, as long as she has a good wife. You got no right to divorce her. But if she said, hey, you're a Christian, I ain't gonna live with no Christian. I, I, I'm leaving. The Bible said, let her go. Then you no longer are the bondage. Brother Johnson, my, my wife and I were together 18 years and she flat out told everybody and told me to my face, you quit going to church, you get away from all of that, and I'll stay. And if not, I'm leaving. She left. Well, I realize I know what Baptist and Holmes people teach. But I'll be fair with you tonight and honest in the assessments. According to what I understand the Bible says, that prevents Steve stay from doing nothing with his church. I went to a church for five years and I did every job of a weakness. But the church told me to my face, they said, well, but well, we can't give you the title that you've been married before. And that really bothered my mom. She said, well, they work you like a dog, but they won't. So, I mean, I don't need no more titles. I so, hope nobody will be hurt when me saying this. I'm not here to fight the folks. But the scripture on deacon and proof as bishop, you must be the husband of one wife. That's a present tense statement. Right. A widow indeed in the fifth chapter of Timothy must have been the wife of one man. That's a past tense statement. Six years old. How many women wives does Dave have? I don't know. Yeah, one. He must be the husband of one wife. That eliminates what's the word polygamy? That eliminates polygamy. He's married to two different women, he can't hold on possession in the church. Yeah. At the same time. In fact, about the church wouldn't even accept him. But if he but here's the fact about polygamy was a very common thing in the days of the Lord. It was very it was very common in the church. Now please, don't fall out with me because I believe these things. As Dave told his story. I don't believe there's a scripture in the Bible for me to come in. That's whether or not you would accept his life. That, that's another story. But as far as his marriage, his wife walked off and left him. The Bible says, what? Run her down, make her come back, go get her, drag her back to the house? No. He says, let her go. Let her go. Then he's no longer under bondage. What does that mean? Now, I had a wife that was a good woman. I, I was bound to that woman. I had no right to leave her unless she'd done something wrong. There was, there was a mom there that I had no right to walk away from. But if she broke it, I'm no longer bound to that marriage. I hope you can still fall out.